Hello, One Young World. My name is Christina Taylor, and I am the CEO of Aim Sky High. And it's my pleasure to be moderating this session today. Um, let me begin by introducing the stage. Please welcome the two winners of the Black Fund's first One Young World scholarship, Shanika Benjamin, Croydon Poet Laureate, Founding Director of Young People Insight CIC. And Ebenita Iyere, founder of Milk Honey Bees and Therapeutic Youth Practitioner. And please also welcome the co-founder and trustee of the Black Fund. You know her from the ultimate girl group, Little Mix, Leanne Pinnick. So Leanne, art is a powerful tool um, which combines creativity and expression. How does art intersect with activism? And from your own experience as a musical artist, how can art be leveraged for generating long-lasting, impactful social change? So I will never forget my first writing session with Little Mix. We always knew we wanted to inspire people for our music. We had a very young following at the start, and we didn't want to call ourselves role models, but we always knew we wanted to speak to them for our music and inspire them. And yeah, that's something that I hope to continue in my solo career and in everything that I do going forward. Like I have a voice, I have a platform, and I want to continue to use it. So. And I think Leanne's doing it really well at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, in order to bring about a world of real equality, it all starts with community. Leanne, what initiatives has your foundation, the Black Fund, taken to support, foster and empower the black community across the UK in the pursuit of equality for all? So I created the Black Fund in 2021. It's a charitable organisation which tackles racism and bridges the equality gap. But there was already so many amazing charities out there doing the work. So um, we just kind of wanted to be like a helping hand to them. The main initiative that we have is the Give Back Grant. And last year we helped 11 charities and funded them with their projects. And this year we have um, applications that are open for the next grant. And it's focusing on mental health. So yeah, lots of things going on. It's growing and growing. And I'm just excited to see where it's going to go. Sounds really exciting. <laughs> How would you define resilience? and what does it mean to each of you? And how has it applied to your work as activists? My home of Croydon is the ultimate definition of resilience. All about coming back from adversity, being knocked down, coming back strong, coming back hard, coming back shaky, just coming back all of the time. And also being able to be vulnerable with that. Resilience doesn't always mean being rock hard all of the time, it just means coming back. And that's enabled me to keep on going through my platform when it was running, or through working as a poet, working with people when I want to give up, just to keep on going, remembering what I'm doing. So I just keep on going. That is resilience, mm -hmm. really. Um, yeah, I'm going to echo Shaniqua in terms of vulnerability. I think that as a black woman, I'm told that I have to be strong and I'm told that I have to show up the way that society wants me to. I feel like resilience for me is about embracing the mistakes and the good, the bad, the ugly, and sometimes the difficulties and adversity that you're put in, that's not actually your fault. And the way that I apply it to my work is through our ethos at Milk Honey Bees, which is healing, empowerment and resilience, and knowing and embracing the resilience that you're given in and beyond your community. Yeah. So I, I just wouldn't mind adding to that a little bit. So for anyone here that might need a little bit of help with um, how to become more resilient mm. um, as a therapeutic practitioner, would you have any advice for them? I think that the best advice that I can give is that play is not just for children. I think that as adults, we're told that we have to be strong or we can't show our emotions. And I think as a therapeutic youth practitioner, what I've learned the most is that showing your emotions is not something that's wrong and it should be allowed in the workplace, in every environment. 
I think working with young people and seeing play in different kinds of ways is what makes Milk Honey Bees really special. I think allowing black girls to show up and be the voice and have visibility in the way that they want is equally important. But I think as an older leader or a real model or role model to these girls, I think one of the best things I've done is give them the space and autonomy that they need to be seen and heard. And even though I'm the founder of Milk Honey Bees, always being aware that I am 29 and I'm a young black woman and these are black girls, so allowing them to take up space, giving them a seat at the table, and making sure that I always put them first the same way that I'm teaching them to put themselves first. And Shanika, how do you feel that um, you can build resilience through the arts, your poet? That's a good one. I think actually as an artist, you've got to be incredibly resilient. You get no's all the time and rejection breaks my heart regularly I try to like <laughs> firm it but oh my goodness it's so hard so I think it's understanding that it's not always a no it's maybe it's a not yet or it's not right for you and to again remembering why you're doing that thing like yeah. if you're just doing it for the money as an artist sometimes you can get money but often you're not going to get loads of money and just remembering like it's speaking from your heart and knowing that sometimes it's just about you getting what you need to get out rather than just thinking about, I want to be known, I want to be seen. So I think it's understanding all of that and being able to talk to someone as well to build that resilience because talking it through and having someone, before I got on here, I was like, I don't feel amazing today. Mm. And my great friend, Evie, was like, you are amazing. And I was like, thank you, I needed that. So having people around you as well is important because as an artist, it can also be very lonely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, I think also as an artist, um, we often use our art as a form of expression. Yeah. Mm. So that anytime we're dealing with rejection, sometimes it, we can use our art as well to, to deal with that, I guess. Mm. Um, so inclusivity plays a crucial role when working to bring about equality for all. What specific actions can every individual take in their own communities to foster safer, more inclusive spaces for young women of colour to thrive and achieve their ambitions? Okay, okay. <laughs> um, I'd say, first of all, don't be tokenistic. I, am, I live in Croydon, which is an amazing, diverse melting pot in South London, but I can see how I'm used as a token often, and it really bothers me. So don't use people as tokens, because also we can see it, mm. like we get to know these things as well. So don't use people as tokens. Also, give us a chance to speak. Don't ask us to do something and then talk about us and then come to us afterwards, because it's frustrating to keep talking all over again. And then you feel like you can't say anything because you don't want to cause problems, because it's really the stigma of being the aggressive, angry black woman, which is not a thing. So it's... Yeah, making sure we're talking and listening to us and being willing to hear. I know that if we may get emotional because we're human beings, so we can get emotional, mm. we can get angry, we can cry, being okay with that and not just putting us down. And also understanding as well certain cultural things about us, if you can, and just, again, understanding. It's that simple. Just look at us as humans. Look at us as humans. Mm. Um, yeah, I definitely echo that, what Shanika said, but also remember that we are not a monolith. I think that sometimes when we talk about race or we talk about women of colour or black women, we categorise and are categorised under this term B-A-M-E, which I'm sure that every person does not like. And I think that re recognising that we are not a monolith is the first thing. Now, the question around fostering spaces, I get asked a lot and I always give three pieces of advice which the first one is listen to hear not listen to respond the second one is also understand the spaces that you want to foster are there existing platforms are there existing spaces that you can support and help and then the third one know your why are you doing it because you care or are you doing it because it's a trend and if it's a trend don't do it if you're doing it because you care embrace every single emotion that you will feel in these spaces because do you know what i said i've said this today without the girls that i support I wouldn't be the person I am, even down to the things that I'm wearing. They are the ones that styled me. I give them the voice and visibility that they deserve because they deserve to be heard and seen. So I think for me, 
it's very important that even if you want to foster spaces, understand that sometimes you have to take a step back to be able to be let in. And just for um, anyone in here, because One Young World is about, you know, taking an, an initiative back after you've been here, thinking about how you can help to make things better. Some people in here might not actually know what a space looks like. We were having that discussion yeah. beforehand. And you were explaining how your girls find space mm -hmm. and what a space is. Um, so would you be OK to yeah. talk about that for us? Um, you know, there's a buzzword called safe spaces at the moment. I think it's a buzzword, just like a lot of things. Um, but a safe space isn't, doesn't necessarily need to be a physical building. I think first safe space is finding safety within yourself. That's the first safe space that I talk to the girls that I support. But also occupying space wherever you can. We were talking about how a safe space for my girls might be talking about milk honey bees on a bus or going outside to look at the trees, as far as they feel safe within themselves, we know that sometimes the world is not a safe place, but the biggest thing that I've taught the girls at Milk Honey Bees and they've reminded me about is that when you occupy space, wherever it may be, whether you've got a seat at the table or you've had to create your own table, safety is wherever you put it and however you see it. I think the biggest thing about safe spaces is also respect and us being able to create our safe spaces, but also respecting other spaces. There's a lot as a black woman that I don't know, but I do know a lot of things. And I think the main thing that I've done with Milk Honey Bees around space is allowing the girls to educate whilst educating them on other differences and other nuances that affect the world. And Shanika, from an arts point of view, how do we create those spaces? Do they look different as an artist? Can they look different or is it the same thing? They can be different and they can be the same thing. I mean, as an artist, you have the beauty of facilitating spaces of expressing yourself through art. So I facilitate a lot of workshops and those are such amazing spaces to learn about people, to speak your truth. I remember, I think last month I did um, a workshop with Allergy UK and the young people of the Allergy Group. And I, I gave them like eight minutes to write a poem after a series of exercises. And what they came up with was amazing, but I was so emotional because I really understood what it was like to live with an allergy. I've got a cousin who's got allergies to a lot of things, but I didn't properly realize what he went through until they expressed that in a poem. And I was just like to my cousin, like, I respect you and I feel you on a higher level. So art helps you to create those spaces and see things in a way that is so vivid and so different mm. and so amazing. But also outside of art, I used on a platform where I had monthly discussion groups and just being like, what do you want to talk about? Come and say what you want to say without being a young person, without being spoken about, without being spoken over, without being spoken just to. And it was amazing what you heard. Mm. So it's, I guess... And also being that comfortable grounding person in the space as well. If you come in and you're like overly hyped or just like a weird kind of presence, it makes it unsettling and people can feel that. If you come in, they're just calm, authentically you. People respond to that and they feel willing to respond. People shared stories that they never told before. And I'm like, I am honored because you shared that in a space with me who you don't know and people you don't know. And it was the most beautiful thing. And I'm like, I was part of that. And that's just the best thing in the world, I think. Yeah. So, so I guess what I'm getting for, from that is for you, you've managed to use arts for young people um, as a way into a space. Mm, so it feels a bit more directed. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So this is for you all. What advice would you give to one young world delegates who are working to bring about racial equality? I think the main thing for me is just don't let anyone silent you. Like, if you know you're, good, you're doing a good thing, just go for it. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to use your voice. You were given a voice for a reason. So. Okay. <laughs> if you are black, I'd say don't be, or black or of anyone who isn't white, 
don't be afraid at times to one say you don't want to talk about it because you have to always relive your trauma it's a lot and don't feel like it's always your space to educate feel comfortable talk about it and if someone gets something wrong not in a um, derogatory way don't always get angry because they don't always understand be willing to have that conversation if you are someone who is white listen as my friend here said, Abenita said, listen to hear and not just to respond. Really listen. Also, educate yourselves if you can. There are so many books out there now. There are so many films. There's like, when you see us, I don't feel like that's fully made for black people. I watched a documentary about the Central Park Five. I'm not reliving that trauma. If you don't know about it, go and watch it. Watch those things, learn about those things. And again, a friend of mine said, a friend of mine who's white said so he doesn't want to be an ally, he wants to be an accomplice. An accomplice to help us with those things, not just like, I'm here as an ally. Help us achieve those things, work together, and don't just speak over us, speak with us, I would say, that's the key thing. Mm -hmm. I think the first thing is about understanding intersectionality, because the intersection of race and gender with religion, with disability, with visibility is very important when talking about race, not just about people of colour, but I think all races. So I would advise everybody to go and understand intersectionality. But also know your worth. I think that sometimes, like Shaniqua said, we're told that we always have to educate. I said it yesterday in the room that Google is free and a lot of people were like, start with by <laughs> me, but it's free. Um, you can literally Google anything, or if you use TikTok as your Google, you can do that too. Um, but I think also the best advice that I was given is rest. Know that you don't always have to show up as people want you to be or who they want you to be. You can just show up as your authentic self and rest. I think what I've learned from One Young World since I've been here is that even the work that I'm doing, because I felt like I shouldn't be here. I've had to remind myself about my worth and about the girls and the community that I support. So I think the biggest advice is know who you are and the world will know who you are so that the world will be able to understand who you are more. I just want to say thank you so much to One Young World. Thank you for putting me in touch with these incredible ladies. Please, can we just give it up for Ebenita and Shamika, please? <laughs> you are selfless, you are powerful, and you are just phenomenal. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you. Aww. I just wanted to say a couple of words here to tell you that during really one of the darkest parts of the pandemic, where we were really struggling to, to see could One Young World actually keep going and what would happen when we couldn't hold an event, and we've talked about it before. And one of the people working with us came to me and said, do you know who Leanne Pinnock is? So, I, you know, I'm a big fan. So I said, yeah, yeah, of course I do. Well, we were in touch with her and she wants to help. She wants to set up a scholarship. She wants to help these young women. I was going, excuse me, a pop star <laughs> wants to, and trust me, it's not common. This unique young woman who not only wanted to help these other amazingly eloquent, powerful women, this unique young woman who decided exactly how she was going to help, what she wanted to be called, designed all those fantastic t-shirts we had at One Young World last yeah. year, which just <laughs> are absolutely amazing, sold out, helped us to fund other places for the summit, is you, Leanne. And there's a lot to be said for someone from your world, which is very exposed, very, very tough, you're utterly beautiful. You are a hell of an artist. Mm -hmm. And I think your personal solo career is going to be more than you ever dreamed. I want to tell you something. There's, you never know, and you two young women are just, you're so, you're so eloquent. It's ridiculous. You are fantastic. <laughs> but Nian, thank you. Thank you for this selflessness. Thank you, Christina. Thank you to the two of you for teaching us. Please keep teaching us. Yeah. Please mm. keep, 
I know you, you need to rest, couldn't agree more, but please, when you show up, show up with us, eager to learn. One Young World, please give these four women this huge round of applause. Woo!